Lechner. From a surgical uh, point of view, it might be interesting to understand where the pineal region is located. Here we can see how it's located below the splenium of the corpus callosum. It's located uh, above the quadrigeminal plate, remember the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Posterior to the third ventricle, here we, have, we can see how the pineal gland faces the posterior wall of the third ventricle. Here we can see also the avenular nuclei located at both sides of the pineal gland. And laterally, the pineal region bounds to the most posterior aspect of the thalamus, that is the pulvinar thalamus. Again, the pineal region from a uh, point, from a surgical point of view, from a purely posterior point of view, again, from superior to inferior, the splenium of the corpus callosum. The number six is the posterior wall of the third ventricle, pineal gland, laterally the avenula, and again, caudally, inferiorly, and posteriorly, we have the uh, superior colliculi, the inferior colliculi. Here you can see how the culmen of the cerebelli, of the cerebellum, hides the most inferior part of the quadrigeminal plate, and also hides the exits of the fourth cranial nerve from the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure. Okay, here we have a cadaveric dissection where we use the endoscope just to show you how we can see the pineal region from the uh, interior of the third ventricle. Here we are inside the third ventricle and the posterior wall of this third ventricle corresponds with the posterior part of the pineal region. It's a little bit complex, but but uh, here we can explain it better with this sagittal exposure, where we can see the number six is the roof of the third ventricle, correspond with the telacoroidea, and uh, the plexus choroideus is the choroid plexus is attached to this telacoroidea, number twelve. Then we have some recesses and uh, prominences that correspond with number. 11 is the suprapineal recess. The number 10 will correspond with the uh, avenular commissure. Okay. The number nine will correspond with the pineal recess. The number eight with the posterior commissure. And finally, and inferiorly, the cerebral aqueduct, the sylvian aqueduct, number seven. Now, very important, the cisternal, the most relevant cisterns. Remember, the most important one will be the quadrigeminal cistern that contains the pineal gland and the quadrigeminal plate. And this cistern is connected with other cisterns, the so-called posterior pericalosal cistern that is close to the splenum of the corpus callosum. Okay, anteriorly, the quadrigeminal cistern is connected with the bellum interpositum. Is the, it corresponds with the roof of the third ventricle and this the way by the internal cerebral veins come from the roof of the third ventricle to join the uh, great vein of Galen. Laterally, the quadrigeminal plate, the quadrigeminal cistern connects with the ambient cistern. The ambient cistern contains the basal vein of Rosenthal the P3 segment of the art, um, posterior cerebral arteries and some the, the cisternal part, the cisternal uh, trajectory of the fourth ventricle. And also we have another system located posteriorly, the so-called cerebellum mesencephalic system that contains the precentral vein, as we will see later on. Don't be scared by this, uh, this complex picture. It's just to show you how the vein anatomy, the, the vein structures are located mainly superior and medially, and the arterial, arterial landmarks, the arterial vessels are located inferior and laterally. And it's very important now, after this brief review of anatomy, how to select the best approach for each case. And we are gonna. Um, differentiate two group of approaches, the supratentorial and infratentorial approaches. Regarding the, uh, supra, the infratentorial supracerebral approaches, we have 
two main routes, the midline approaches, the infratentorial supracerebral midline approach, and its variant, the paramedian approach. <clears throat> okay, now the one of the most important factors we have to uh, consider in our decision is the tentorial angle. The tentorial angle is measured between the line that connects the nation with the tuberculum cell and another line that corresponds with the stride sinus. The normal valors are between 27 and uh, 52 degrees. And obviously, <clears throat> if the angle is higher than usual, the infratentorial route will be more difficult. Okay, the first approach we're gonna describe is the more classical route, the infratentorial supracerebral midline approach. Remember with this route, we cross the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. And after that, we have to cross the cerebellum encephalic fissure and the quadrigeminal plate before reaching the pineal region, the pineal gland. And this route, okay, finds the venous complex above our target that is the pineal gland. Okay, about the position is a very controversial issue. The sitting position is used most commonly because gravity helps the retraction of the cerebellum, facilitates dissection of other veins from the tumor, and decreases bleeding from the tumor by reducing the venous pressure. However, uh, use the sitting position might cause critical systemic complications such as air embolism or hypotension. This complication must be prevented by careful uh, surgical hemostasis and anesthetic uh, monitoring. But to avoid the potential complications caused by the sitting position, we can also use the concord or prone position that uh, allow us to uh, combine elements of the prone and sitting position and give surgeon access to the pineal region, reducing possible air embolism. About the skin incision is by is based on localizing rightly the position of the transverse sinus and the torcula. And for that, remember the rule of the line that connects the zygomatic arc and the inion that allow us to uh, predict the theoretical position of the transverse sinus. And our incision will be at less uh, about one third superior to the torcula and two thirds inferior to the to the inner or torcula. This is a surgical exposure for for <clears throat> usual suboccipital approach where foramen and magnum and posterior part of C1 is even exposed. But for pineal region approaches, this bone opening is not necessary. Here the craniotomy, three bar holes are usually made with one of them uh, located um, at the sagittal sinus just above the torcula and two at the lateral aspect of the transverse sinus bilaterally. It's not necessary, uh, I repeat, the, to open the foramen magnum. The main purpose of the craniotomy is to expose these crossing elements here superiorly the most posterior and uh, ending part of the stride sinus, laterally the transverse sinus, and inferiorly the occipital sinus. And here we write, we draw the uh, dural opening that is always curdling and pedicle with its base on the trigeminal, or, or, sorry, the transverse sinus. And we reflect the dural opening upwards. Here, after the, the dura is open, the bridging veins will be visible. We see the uh, two groups of veins here, the inferior Bermian veins and the inferior hemispheric veins. And uh, probably we need, we need to divide, to sacrifice them in order to get access to this uh, narrow uh, space. Here we are, uh, we are getting depth in our approach and we find now a new group of veins, in this case, the superior Bermian and superior hemispheric veins. In this case, the risk of dividing them is higher than the inferior veins and we should respect them as much as possible, obviously. Deeper in our approach, uh, we find the posterior incisura with its usual elevation 
This arachnoid overlying the, the quadriluminal region is open and sharply. This arachnoid is usually thickened by and partially opaque uh, when tumors are present. And after, after opening the arachnoid membrane at the, of the quadriluminal region, this complex neurovascular anatomy of the tentorial incisula is exposed. Because of the tentorial notch and an upper, um, upper vermis and the culmen of, of the belly, the operating field is very limited in this area. And so we need this inferior retraction of the cerebellar apex to see, the, to see rightly this anatomical landmarks. And now to summarize the vascular elements here from superior to inferior, the most important element, the grid vein of Galen in the midline, and again, from superior to inferior, the occipital internal vein that comes from the supratentorial space, from the, the occipital lobe to join the grid vein of Galen. Here, the explenial vein that runs close to the splenium. This not commonly mentioned vein is the atrial vein coming from the atrium. The basal vein of Rosenthal uh, coming from the um, ambient system and the precentral vein. Also, the arterial relations with the calcarine artery that goes to the uh, supratentorial space, to the uh, medial aspect of the occipital lobe, and the P3 segment of the cerebral posterior artery. Again, here with more retract, more inferior retraction of the cerebellum, we are all we are able to see the internal cerebral veins coming from the roof of the third ventricle from the bellum interpositum, remember. And with more inferior retraction, we can see the pineal gland. And with more retraction, we can see the superior colliculi with the precentral vein of the vein of the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure right here. But remember that it's very difficult to see the uh, inferior colliculi from this uh, approach. Now to summarize the benefits and problems of this approach, Remember, the orientation is very easy because we are um, using a midline approach from posterior to anterior. Uh, it's very good approach for midline lesions, and the venous complex is always above our approach. But the problems are, as we have mentioned, the cerebral apex hides some anatomical structures. With, if we have a high tentorial angle, it's probably we have to change the approach. We have to deal with the precentral vein. The inferior colliculi, colliculi are hidden by the by the culmen of the cerebelli, and to to transverse the the dural uh, surface, we have to cross the occipital sinus and inferior permeable veins. Let me show you this this case of a, a ten years old uh, child with an acute onset headache and vomits, suffering from an early puberty syndrome six months before. The first step was to perform an emergent ETB to, to improve the hydrocephalus. After that, we analyzed the CSF markers that were elevated. And so we decided to start with chemo and radiotherapy. But three months later, we performed this uh, MRI and the tumor was, was bigger. So we decided to perform a surgical approach, a midline intratentorial supracerebellar approach. Remember our position of the uh, skin incision with one third superior to the inion and two thirds inferior. We use the sitting position in this case. Here, the dural opening that, it's, that needs to cross the occipital sinus. In this case, it was not really prominent. We need to divide the inferior vermian veins to get access to this narrow corridor, supracerebral cerebellar and infratentorial. We, here we are dealing now with the superior vermian veins. We are in the posterior incisura with its usual elevation. We need to divide these veins in order to uh, relieve, to, to retract inferiorly the culmen. And here, probably the most important um, step of this approach is to separate the tumor from the surrounding uh, venous structures and, and arterial structures is needs a sharp dissection, very careful dissection. Here we need some debulking of the tumor. 
We are separating the tumor now from the most superior and inferior aspect. We are here leaving superior and intact the vein of gallen. And remember that the anterior part of the tumor faces the most posterior part of the third ventricle. Let me show you now when we remove the tumor in one piece, we can see a beautiful view of the third ventricle and the roof of the third ventricle with both foramen of Monroe's. Here, the bellum interpositum with the choroid plexus from, from below. After that, we had this MRI with the complete uh, removal of the tumor and the, the patient did well after, after that. Here, let me show you now the variant of this approach is the paramedian approach. In this case, <clears throat> our route is uh, a little bit parallel to the midline. And with this approach, we have a, a better control of the lateral systems, especially the lateral aspect of the quasi-geminal system and the ambient system with a good control, a better, better control of the inferior uh, colliculum and the ipsilateral superior colliculum. In this case, the skin incision is located at the midpoint between the inion and the asterion laterally. Again, one third superior to the transverse sinus and two thirds inferior. This is the bonus posture, again, where we need to expose the asterion laterally and the inion medially. To perform the craniotomy, again, we use three bar holes. In this case, the uh, lateral bar hole is located at the asterion, and the medial bar hole is located near the inion, but in our opinion, we don't need to do that over the torcula to avoid uh, problems with the, this complex part of the venous uh, dural anatomy. And again, one third superior to the transverse sinus and two thirds inferior. Now we need to, uh, it's, it's very important to see how we have here, we have left intact the midline structure, the torcula, the sagittal sinus, and even the inferior vermian veins. And our route is parallel. So the cerebellar retraction, you can see here how it's more easy than the uh, midline retraction. And we now don't have to deal with the uh, coolment of the cerebelli. As you can see here, we have a better control of the uh, ipsilateral part of the quadrigeminal plate, the superior colliculus, the inferior colliculus. We have here a better control of the uh, ambient system and this part of the quadrigeminal uh, system. And again, the venous anatomy, remember the internal cerebral veins on both sides. The, um, in, sorry, the internal occipital veins, the basal vein of Rosenthal, uh, joining all together to the uh, Greek vein of Galen. This is another <clears throat> surgical view to show you the relation of the in posterior incisural space with the parahypocampal gyrus, the most posterior part of the parahypocampal gyrus. And remember, there is an approach, uh, the trans, the inferior infratentorial, sorry, the supracerebellar transtentorial approach that allow us to uh, deal with tumors located in this posterior part of the uh, parahypocampal gyrus. Let me summarize the, the benefits and drawbacks of this approach. In this case, we don't have to deal with the precentral vein and the cerebellar apex. Uh, it's not necessary to sacrifice the vermian veins, and we have a better control of the ipsilateral tectum and ambient system. The problem is that we don't have a good control of the contralateral tectum. And finally, we need to review another less used but very uh, useful uh, anatomical uh, surgical approach is the interhemispheric occipital transtentorial approach. In this case, the root is supratentorial above the transverse sinus and lateral to the most posterior to the end of the stride sinus. So the, this is the surgical view we have. And uh, probably the most important step in, in, in these approaches is to separate the occipital uh, love from the uh, falx and the uh, stride uh, and the sagittal sinus. It's very important to have, uh, or I, I want to show you, I want to tell you two tricks to avoid complications with this approach. One of the first, uh, the first trick is to avoid crossing bridging veins coming from the 
uh, cortical surface of the occipital lobe to the uh, striped sinus. And we can predict it, uh, studying very well the previous MRI and, some, uh, and doing some venous reconstruction with some um, radiological software. And another advice is to use the lateral position as many um, interhemispheric approaches because this lateral position will allow us to retract better the occipital lobe that is located inferior in our approach. And other benefit of this approach is that the uh, our corridor will be horizontal and it's in the same plane, plane of our uh, movements of the horizontal movements of our hands. If we use the neutral position, the the movements of our hands to profit the vertical corridor will be in this in this way and probably is less comfortable for us. This is the surgical view, the occipital loft retracted laterally and medially the falls. Here we have opened the falls to show you the contralateral occipital loft. Here the stride sinus and the joint of the stride sinus with the uh, inferior um, inferior sagittal sinus. And here how we have to open the tentorium to get access to the pineal region. And here you can check how the venous anatomy is located above the pineal lamp. So if we wanna deal, if we wanna approach a purely pineal tumor or a purely uh, pineal pathology, uh, the problem is that we have to cross this, this venous complex. So it's this approach is probably better for tumors, for pathology that is located above this venous complex. The benefits, benefits are that it's a good approach for high tentorial angle um, anatomy, for lesion located above or lateral to the venous complex, and the problems, I repeat, is that the venous complex limits the access to the pineal gland. We have a bad control of the contralateral tectum, and uh, remember the visual uh, deficit secondary to occipital lobe retraction. We have to be very careful, careful with this uh, anatomy. Uh, let me show you also another uh, variant of these approaches is the uh, occipital transtentorial uh, transcalosal approach. If we want to enter the posterior part of the third ventricle or even the pineal region, we can uh, cross or, or, um, uh, trans or, or yes, cross the, the splenium of the corpus callosum, and then we have this vision of the internal cerebral veins joining the a grid vein of Galen, and here the posterior medial choroidal artery. And uh, if we want to enter the inside the third ventricle or the pineal gland, we have to separate laterally both internal veins. And to conclude, let me show you this case of a 40 years old male with a headache and perinot syndrome. Uh, because of the hydrocephalus, we start doing a an ETB and, and try to do a biopsy. With this, we improved the hydrocephalus, but uh, okay, after the analysis, we uh, found the negative CSF markers and negative biopsy. And uh, we decided to, to operate uh, the tumor. Uh, here you can see how the, the tumor is located uh, a little bit lateral to the pineal region, more, more on the left side, and seems to be more supratentorial than infratentorial in the sagittal views. And let me show you this detail of the uh, CT scan where we can see how the calcified pineal gland is located is pushed medially medially to the to the tumor and it uh, makes us to think that the that the we are not dealing with the purely pineal tumor and it's lateral to the pineal region so we decided to perform an occipital trans to be very careful with the venous anatomy in this case we with this reconstruction uh, we find this bridging veins located superior to our corridor and how this reconstruction corresponds with our approach. Here we have opened the dura, and this bridging vein is located superior to our theoretical corridor that is below the vein and from the vein to the, to the torcula right here. Here, the surgical video. How the 
uh, after pushing, after retracting inferiorly the occipital lobe, we reach the tentorial surface where we try to uh, find the position of the stride sinus with the Doppler device and always below and parallel to the stride sinus, we open the, the tentorial incisura and we find directly the, the tumor. So we were very happy with this approach because we were not very, um, very sure that we are gonna find directly the tumor after opening the tentor, the tentorium. Here we are the bulk in the tumor, separating the tumor from the splenium of the corpus callosum that it's here with the, uh, we think this is the splenial vein and the splenium. The tumor was not very soft. And here we are removing some pieces of tumor very attached to the, um, to the tectal plate of the mesencephalum. We were very careful with this part of the removal. We predict here, we, after removing the anterior part of the tumor, we connect our approach with the posterior part of the third ventricle, open here. And we decided coagulate, but not remove the tumor attached to the tectal plate. And probably the venous and the venous structures are were located on the other, on the contralateral surface of the tumor. After, the, after that, this was the MRI where some pieces of tumor wells were left uh, here attached to the, to the tectum and the venous complex were on the other side of the approach. And to conclude, just to mark the, the complexity of this anatomy, we need to uh, have good experience to work very, work very hard in the lab to, to be very familiarized with this anatomy and very important to consider the individual factors to select the best approach. And again, uh, study anatomy and practice anatomy. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for the brilliant presentation. Very nice anatomy and show many ways to arrive to the era. I think you can go directly to Dr. Musi if you talk about anatomy, maybe, and leave the discussion to the end. I think it should be okay to everybody. It's okay for you, Javier. Can you stay with us? It's okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay. The next speaker is our friend, Brazilian guy, uh, very well known around the world, great anatomist, uh, Professor Antonio Musi from Florianópolis, <laughs> Brazil. He was in our, in our last. Hello. Let me see, share. Um, I didn't hear what you said, Borb, I'm sorry. Probably some problem here, but let me try to share the screen. Um, is it all right? Can you hear me? Is it all right? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Now I can hear it. I was telling okay. them Musi, that you speak Russian. You could be could give the, the lecture in Russian. You know, see? <laughs> I, I wish I could. I go ahead, I could. Please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead, First go ahead. of all, I would like to thank Professor Sufyanov and Professor Borba for the opportunity to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, I was in two men with Dr. Ivandra a few years ago, and it's a great honor for me to be uh, participating in, in this conference. Uh, my talk will be like a continuation of what uh, Dr. Javier has just uh, told us about. Uh, it's a microsurgical anatomy of the approaches to the pineal region. And uh, what I would like to do is to compare in the same anatomical specimen, the three surgical approaches that uh, Dr. Javier has told us about. 
So the posterior occipital interhemispheric approach, the inferior infratentorial supracerebellar approach, and the paramedian infratentorial approach. So starting with the occipital transtentorial approach, this approach uh, takes advantage of this region here from the external uh, occipital protuberance to the lambda, where it's usually devoid of veins. You have a, a larger vein uh, at the side, at the level of the lambda, but you have a corridor of seven centimeters, usually with no veins. And the, the sinus is not so difficult to dissect and expose in a posterior approach. So you, you go one burrow just above the occipital protuberance, another burrow on the level of the uh, lambda and sagittal sinus, and you expose the sagittal sinus and you can open the dura like this. And always, usually you have this vein exactly on the upper level of your exposure. And you have about seven centimeters with no veins uh, that you can go an interhemispheric approach. Uh, doing like this, the occipital lobe is elevated and uh, retracted laterally. And you have, uh, you complete your exposure by dividing the tentorial parallel to the straight sinus. And this is the view you have, the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. And now I will show you exactly the same anatomical specimen seen from these three different angles. So starting from the occipital transtentorial approach, this is on the left side, you have the, the tentorium here, the fox, the straight sinus, and you have the splenium of the corpus callosum, the calcarine sulcus is here, and this is the, the vein running along the splenium, this is vein of Galen, and this is basal vein of Rosenthal, and this is a vein draining on the lateral side, on the medial side of the, of the brain. This is going to be uh, the, the posterior part of the parahypocampal gyrus. And this is going to be lingual gyrus. So you open the tentorium, and this is, by opening the tentorium, you expose the quadrigeminal plate. Uh, you can see uh, the precentral vein, the basal vein, the internal cerebral vein on the other side, and the pineal gland and the quadrigeminal cistern. This approach, you can see that the venous structure uh, is exposed on the middle of your view. You have uh, better exposure above the vein of Galen. You see the both internal cerebral veins, the vein, of, the basal vein of Rosenthal, and the splenium of the corpus callosum, the pineal gland. Here you can open the tentorium. Uh, this is before opening the tentorium, the pineal gland. You, you can get also access to the third ventricle. You see the internal cerebral vein coming here, the precentral vein, and you can open just above the pineal and get access to the third ventricle. You have a good view because you're coming more laterally. You don't, you, you avoid the highest portion of the tentorial surface of the cerebellum and you have a better view of the quadrigeminal plate with the superior and inferior colliculi. Also, in this approach, you can go more laterally. So this is uh, the basal vein of Rosenthal. This is the posterior part of the mesencephalum. This is the lateral mesencephalic vein. And this part here is the posterior part of the parahypocampal gyrus. So you see the branches of the posterior cerebral artery. This is going to be the calcarine fissure up here. So this is lingual gyrus and continuing here with the parahypocampal gyrus. So this approach can also uh, take advantage of the lateral view to ac access, for instance, lesions on the uh, posterior part of the parahypocampal gyrus. Another advantage 
comparing with the infratentorial approaches is that you have a much better view above the vein of Galen. You can dissect the, inter, the posterior part of the interhemispheric fissure. You can even uh, access the contralateral side by doing an incision above the straight sinus on the folks and look to the other side. This is a precentral vein, basal vein of Rosenthal. This is the vein coming from the medial side of the brain. This is the uh, posterior part of the corpus callosum. Now, this is, this is exactly the same specimen now seen from an infratentorial supracerebellar approach. So now the, bi the biggest difference is now that you have the vein of Galen on the upper uh, view, on, on your upper side of, uh, of your surgical view. So vein of Galen is up here. You have uh, internal cerebral vein on this side. On the other side, it's difficult to see. You have basal vein on one side, basal vein on the other side. And you have the precentral vein, which is usually divided so the cerebellum can uh, go down a little bit more. And you have a symmetrical view of the uh, anatomical structures, the superior colliculus, as Dr. Javier uh, told us, because we are going on the midline, the highest portion of the tentorial surface, it's difficult to see the inferior colliculum. But uh, you have a direct view to the third ventricle. And here you see the internal cerebral vein together with the, this artery here that goes on the uh, uh, upper side of the third ventricle. And you see here, this is the suprapineal recess. You can open here and get direct access to the third ventricle. But compare this view with the view that we have with the occipital transtentorial approach. You see vein of Galen is here. We have a much more limited view of the splenium of the corpus callosum. We can see a little bit here, but much more limited than the other side, than the other view. And here by opening uh, the tila, the choroid just above the pineal gland, you have a direct view to the third ventricle. So symmetrical view, and we can see the differences with the other approach. Just to give you uh, uh, localization, if you open the tentorium here, exactly the same structures. Now you see the vein coming from the medial side of the brain. This is the atrial vein, basal vein of Rosenthal, and this is internal cerebral vein. So this is going to be lingual gyrus, and this is going to be parahippocampal gyrus. So we are going on the midline. Uh, so this is what you see. This is the calcarine sulcus up here, posterior part of the uh, cingulate gyrus. Now, this is the paramedian approach. Paramedian approach was described by Dr. Yassergill, and it takes advantage of the slope of the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. So if you come more laterally, you, you have a more lateral view with the slope and you can better see the quadrigeminal plate. Also, you have uh, theoretically less, uh, you, have, you don't have to sacrifice so much veins as you go on the midline. So you can see the uh, pineal region, the pineal gland, superior and inferior colliculi, trochlear nerve, and lateral mesencephalic vein. Uh, you can, of course, you can combine the, the resection of the bone to, and combine the paramedian with the median approach, just going more laterally. And if you open the, the tentorium, you can see the parahippocampal gyrus with the uh, arterial branches from the posterior cerebral artery. So this is basal vein. This, the calcarine sulcus is up here. So this is parahippocampal gyrus. And this approach has been used for lesions also on the parahippocampal gyrus. You can also see the mesencephalum. You, you can uh, approach 
the lesions on the mesencephalon here, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus is exposed. This is just to show the complexity of the anatomy here, the basal vein. This is going to be the thalamus here, atrial vein, the other vein coming from the medial side of the brain, and this is the internal cerebral vein and basal vein of Galen. All these pictures is the same specimen used. So here you can see quadrigeminal plate, you can approach lesions on the pineal region. Now let's see some, some cases. Uh, and we can use uh, now this knowledge of the difference of the approaches to, uh, to choose which one would be the best. Usually le uh, small lesions can be approached either way, above or below, but there are some difference as Dr. Javier showed us. This is another case. If you look here, you can see that this lesion is on the posterior part of the splenium of the corpus callosum and just above the venous system. So if you go from below, it's going to be much more difficult than if you go from above. This, this was a glioma uh, located on the posterior part of, of the Singulate uh, of the singulum uh, of the corpus callosum. I'm sorry. So this the tumor just above the vein of Galen. So it's important to look to the vein. This was a, another case: a 40 year old uh, woman with a lesion in the pineal region. And if you look here again above the venous system, usually tumors of the pineal gland they push the veins upwards. So this again showing the lesion uh, uh, pushing the veins uh, downward. So another instance that you, it's much easier to come from above than from below. Uh, and this is the post-operative uh, view. We did the occipital transtentorial approach and it was a meningioma. Uh, this is a, a large uh, lesion on the pineal region. And you can see here, a large lesion. And again, if you look to the venous structures, it's, it's above the veins. And of course, this lesion also has uh, uh, component, supratentorial component. So again, you would choose uh, 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 the occipital transtentorial approach. So just to show uh, some, so this is the positioning of the, of the patient, the incision. You take advantage of the, of the gra of gravity and you expose it this way, do the burr holes, and expose the sagittal sinus. Uh, sagittal sinus exposed, it's not, usually you don't have much bleeding here. Again, you have the vein going on the upper side of the approach. And you can uh, open, uh, this is on, on the right side, you can open parallel to the straight sinus, the other side, and uh, remove the lesion on the other side. So you can open here above, uh, the, you can open the folks above the straight sinus and expose the other side. And you see occipital lobe on both sides after opening. And again, this was another meningioma on this region. So much more easier to resect the lesion uh, with this approach than the other one. And you can see both occipital lobes. Now, uh, just to, to show uh, what the uh, approach offers, this is a, a lesion a metastasis located on the posterior part of the parahypocampal gyrus, not the pineal lesion, but this region is exposed also in our approach and you can use the, the approach to resect these lesions. You can see here, Parahypocampal gyrus and occipital transtentorial approach was used to resect this lesion. Another uh, example, this was a uh, AVM located on the uh, posterior parahypocampal gyrus. So you can use, use also tran uh, occipital transtentorial approach. You see branches 
uh, feeding branches coming from the posterior cerebral artery, and the AVM was resected with an occipital transtentorial approach. And finally, also lesions uh, uh, located on the atrium. This was a child with a small lesion located on the atrium. If you come laterally, you can damage the optic radiation. So another way to, uh, to remove this lesion is coming again, exactly the same approach, occipital transtentorial approach. Uh, the atrium is located just above uh, the quadrigeminal sister. So you open the uh, uh, above the, the splenium of the corpus callosum, you just open the cingulate gyrus and you get to the atrium. And so this is exposing exactly the same approach, occipital transtentorial approach. You, you locate the, the cor corpus callosum and you do an incision along the cingulate gyrus. And this is the tumor. And this is the atrium. Uh, exposed after removing the tumor. And this is the post-operative view. So I would like to thank you. I just did a revision of the, uh, the angles that and limitations of each approach. And I thank you again for the opportunity to participate. Today is beautiful for me. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Great as always. Fantastic, fantastic. Antonio, I think that next time you'll be here with us with a great presentation. Thank you. Last time. Thank you. Beautiful, Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful case. Now I uh, have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Elder Tedeschi. Every, everybody knows him, maybe he doesn't need any introduction. Dr. Elder or the first fellow of Professor Evandro. And people say that's the real son of Professor Evandro <laughs> de Rivera. Uh, wonderful case. And when you see Professor Elder Tedeschi present, when you see the videos of Professor Tedeschi, you, you remember Dr. Evandro de Rivera. A pleasure. Elder, take your time, the word is here to listen and watch you. Thank you, my friend. Go ahead. Thank you for the introductory remarks. Um, first of all, I want to thank Professor Sufianov for the kind invitation and also Dr. Borba. And I want to apologize to Alia for waking her up at four o'clock in the morning because I completely forgot about the time zone. And she's been very helpful. Uh, can I see if I can uh, share my screen? Can you see it? Is that okay? Yes, can I you can. see it? It's perfect. Okay, again. Yeah. So um, we'll be talking about surgery of the pineal region. I think the previous speakers have uh, already uh, covered the whole anatomy. And I see the pineal region as a region, so it encompasses much more than the pineal tumors, uh, the, go, the, the ones that go to the pineal glands. And I'll try to um, uh, show some of my experience on, uh, on the subject. I have to uh, pay homage to my mentors, Professor Oliveira, Professor Carvalho, and Dr. Roton. And uh, I've learned everything I know from them. So my experience in the pineal region is uh, around 50 tumors. And uh, you can see the ones in black are the ones in the pediatric population and the ones in yellow and adult population. So we know that most of the tumors in the young subjects are germinomas and uh, those that are embryonal in origin. And others uh, we can see in the adult population, those that are also from the pineal gland or also meningiomas in the region as uh, Dr. Musi has shown. Um, my experience with um, young subjects, the, the children, comes from uh, this institute, which is called the Centro Baldrini. <clears throat> 
We, in the past 11 years, had 820 surgeries for CNS tumors, and I've collected 36 pineal region tumors. Uh, I'm gonna skip the anatomy here, but just, um, this is from Musi. I think his are the best slides in the world. And in this slide, we can see where we're gonna be dealing uh, with our pathologies, the posterior part of the third ventricle, the pineal gland, the venous complex, is on, on, complex on top, the contents of the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure, the posterior part of the parahippocampal gyrus, the mesencephalon and the quadrigeminal plate are all here. So tumors that arise in any of these uh, elements can be uh, dealt with with the different approaches as Dr. Javier has shown. I usually um, elect my cases uh, by the tentorial angle here. And when this is too steep, I go interhemispheric occipital transtentorial, or in some cases we go um, supracerebellar infratentorial. And I'm gonna show you what I think about all the approaches and some of the modifications that I've done um, according to the experience gathered throughout the years. So um, I had a big problem when I first started because I'm a very skinny guy. I don't have much uh, power in my arms. And so standing uh, with a patient's uh, position in a semi-seating position with my arms stretched uh, was very hard for me. So my, the beginning of my experience was uh, mostly on a supratentorial, I mean, infratentorial supracerebellar approach, but I had to adapt. And so I started looking at how people usually operated upon, and I came uh, to, to see this uh, approach by Dr. Stanaka and Washiyama, and they usually would perform their surgeries for the pineal region with the patient in this position here, in the lateral position, uh, looking downwards, and, um, but with a slight difference from what I do now. This is uh, actually was modified by myself here. Most of his uh, drawings are depicted with the right side down but I am a right-handed surgeon. So if I place my patient with uh, right side down, I would be feeling like one, uh, when you get your meal, you're on a flight and you get your meal on the airplane. So it's very tough to go with your right hand coming from the right side. You have to make a curve like this. And uh, I found it very, very uncomfortable. So I decided to place the patient with the left side down. And that gives you this opening here. So the good hand, the right hand for the right-handed surgeons come this way with the bipolar. We do not come this way, we come this way here. And imagine if you have to come all the other way, your, your aspiration tube would be the left hand coming from the right and the, the right hand would come straight on top of the brain. So I modified and I always operate with the left side down. Very important for the ones that are starting. When you place your patient, you should not flex the, the neck too much. And the head on the right side, in this case, with the ear here, should be pointing towards the shoulder, the upper shoulder. Why you have to do this? Because when you do this and you do not flex too much the head, the posterior, the anterior part of the cerebellum will not fall on top of the pineal region. So if you flex too much the head, the, the cerebellum will come all the way up and be on top of your surgical exposure. So make sure that the head is tilted and uh, the, the neck is not too much flexed. This is very important. So this is the positioning. We can operate it seated on the side. I will start with the, um, uh, cerebellar, uh, the infratent, I mean, interhemispheric uh, occipital transtentorial approach. You can be sitting here comfortably. You don't have to stretch your arms, and this is a very comfortable position. Make sure that you place your patient very close to the edge of the table so that you don't have to stretch your arms. It, it will be very, very close to you. 
I favor this kind of incision rather than the other one that uh, Dr. Uh, Musi has shown and uh, Dr. Javier also that goes like that. If you just uh, put your incision like this with this, this leg very short here, you do not damage the occipital artery, but you have one advantage. When you turn this flap down, it's much easier to control, control the bleeding that goes on the surface here. Uh, when you, you turn the flap down here towards this way, like a, a box like that, this part here never tilts enough so that you, you, you still have bleeding on the edges here. And I don't like that. So uh, make sure to have uh, enough exposure so that your craniotomy will be uh, big enough like this. This is a superior sagittal sinus. This is a transverse sinus here. And there should be enough space here so that when the occipital lobe falls by gravity, it will not lean against a sharp edge of bone that can damage uh, the brain tissue here. So a good size craniotomy would avoid that. The way I open the dura, I do not like incisions that are like in a star because uh, the sharp edges are difficult to, to sew back and sometimes you have uh, uh, problems with CSF fistula. So I like uh, an incision that has its base on the superior sagittal sinus. So I start cutting like this, going all the way. And the thing is that when you come to the occipital pole, this is not square. It's not a, a, a right angle here. So what do we do? We go a little bit up towards this portion here. So the base will be almost like this, and then you can flip the whole thing up and you don't have any uh, sharp edges of dura either against the brain. So this is what you want to end up with. The whole, uh, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the whole occipital pole is exposed, as uh, Dr. Musi has pointed out. This, most of the times, this place is devoid of veins. And this vein here, it corresponds to where the parietal occipital sulcus meets the surface on the top here, on the convexity. So first step is to have this. And then I'm going to use... Uh, this small case here, this is a um, um, pineoblastoma on a 35-year-old guy. And I decided to operate interhemispheric transdentorial uh, inter uh, occipital. And here we have the places posi positioned to the left side down. And what we can see by transparency here is the straight sinus. This would be the trochlear region. You can see here, this is the tent, the tentorial. And what we do, instead of cutting the dura along the straight sinus, because many veins drain here or venous lakes drain here. So it's best to open oblique. Can you still hear me? My connection is bad here. So I, I like to open this in an oblique fashion. And this uh, will be tailored according to the size of your pathology. If you have a small tumor, you don't have to open very wide. You can open this way. But you have, if you have a big tumor, you can open this way and have a, a bigger size uh, leaflet here. I do not use lumbar drain because I rely on anatomy. And I know this vein is on the parietal occipital sulcus. So if I follow this down, and I see the splenium of the corpus callosum a little bit inferiorly, I will see where the P3 segment of the posterior cerebral artery divides into a parietal occipital branch and the calcarine branch. And at this portion here, you have a cistern. You can come with your scalpel here or your scissors and you can open uh, a little hole here and stay there with your suction tube up until you have a good CSF drainage and the occipital lobe will fall by gravity after draining here. So there's no need for lumbar drain. So after releasing this, I will do that cut I told you on the tent. And this portion here, I can lift up 
with stitches and I can also place stitches below here after leave, uh, lifting this uh, flap up to make uh, uh, um, an arch, like uh, an arch with a um, uh, straight sinus so that I can have a view towards the other side. So this is the place where I choose to start with because at this point here, a little like two or three centimeters in front of the angle between straight sinus and transverse sinus is where the dura of the tent is, is further away from the cerebellum. So I can cut here and, and then after I make a cut, after coagulation, I can place my bipolar blades in between and coagulate all the way down and cut. So this is what we do. We cut towards the, the edge of the tent. And remember for the younger uh, surgeons that are listening to us, the farther you go down here, the more likely you are to uh, encounter the fourth cranial nerve. So be careful when you, you do this maneuver when you open down here. At this portion here, there is no problem. Then after we cut the dura, we elevate this part here, and then we will end up with a part of the quadrangular lobule and the upper portion of the central and combing of the vermis of the cerebellum. And then you have a, a very thick uh, membrane here that um, covers the venous complex. And then this is a, a question that comes from everybody that's starting to, to do surgery in this region. Where should I open this in order not to damage the veins? If you remember what Dr. Antonio Musi showed, uh, the orientation of the veins, most of the veins, they converge towards the vein, the venous, vein of Galen complex. So they come in oblique way all the way up. So the best place to start is very close to the cerebellum down here. There is no veins here. So if you start here, you can go up slowly, little by little dissecting, and you will find all the veins that you need. And then that's what we have here. We have the cerebellum here. This is where the P3 segment uh, enters uh, both soci, and we can find the um, uh, basal vein of Rosenthal. And with the dissection tube and with the scissors, we can gently go and progress our dissection towards the midline. Here you can see I'm uh, dividing and separating all the, the small vessels that constitute the anterior part of the, the central abule. And uh, we can see the tumor already here. This is uh, a portion of the precentral cerebellar vein. And right between uh, basal vein of uh, Rosenthal and precentral cerebellar vein, you have the opening for the cisterna of the velo interpositum. So this is the, the posterior part of the third ventricle. I again, then after I uh, have this uh, dissected and exposed, I can go to the other side. And you can see there, I have a, a hinge stitch here, uh, making an arch on my uh, straight sinus. And I can see the tent on the other side. I can then separate and look directly at the, the arachnoid membrane that covers this part. And then I will proceed towards the other side, uh, moving the cumin and the central lobule posteriorly. There we have, this is a uh, basal vein, precentral cerebellar vein, and then you can start to see the other uh, basal vein of Rosenthal. And there it is, the basal vein of Rosenthal on the other side, precentral cerebellar vein. What are we gonna do now? We have the tumor here. I can coagulate the precentral cerebellar vein. There it is, coagulating. And after I divide the precentral cerebellar vein, I can open, in this case, the cisterna of the velo interpositum and start to work on the top of the tumor. On the sides of the tumor, I can work. And then the, the space is done. And then it's a matter of dissecting and removing the tumor. And after we, we do our, our dissection, we can uh, also encounter the, the posterior middle choroidal arteries, which in most of the cases and tumors in this region are responsible for the um, irrigation of the tumor. So we can find it and uh, start working on the surface. You see, we work on uh, 
base of n on one side, base of n on the other side. The major drawback of this approach, I would say, is to look at the ipsilateral side. This part of the tumor sometimes is hidden. But look, I'm not working this way in this direction. I'm working from here, there. So the angle should be from the occipital pole up to the uh, region of the pineal gland, not on the sides here. And imagine if you were operating on the right side, your hand would be just the opposite. So uh, very, very uncomfortable. This is after the tumor is being removed and can, you can look, and this is vein of Galen, basal vein of Rosenthal, basal vein of Rosenthal, third ventricle, and uh, this is superior colliculum. So this is post-op. And uh, I'm gonna show you a series of cases and try to, um, uh, understand anatomy through looking at the cases. So when you look at this small tumor here, this is a pineal cytoma. And uh, as Musi uses the veins, I also uses the vein, use the veins, and I use uh, the cooming of the cerebellum as a landmark to position where my tumor is. So I know that this is in the posterior part of the third ventricle. It has passed uh, the vein of Galen. So it's inside the posterior part of the third ventricle. You see, um, when I open interhemispheric uh, occipital, I, transitorial, I will not see the tumor. The tumor is inside the third ventricle. So again, sometimes you have uh, bridging veins here. They can be coagulated. The major problem with veins are not here. The problems are here. In the, the inferior part of the, the occipital pole, sometimes there are important veins and you have to preserve them. Be very careful when you, you place your retractor here. So this vein was divided and sacrificed. And uh, then we start. You remember this, parieto occipital sulcus? This is the splenium. I know that right after the splenium, down the, the parieto occipital sulcus, I can drain CSF here. This is the vein of Galen, quadrigeminal plate, and this is the cerebellum. And I know that the tumor is not here. So this gray space here, here I can open, is the cisterna of the velo interpositum. And after opening this, I can uh, work and remove my tumor. Just anatomy. This anatomy is, is good to show you how to get there. So try to identify the corpus callosum. Right after the corpus callosum, you have uh, the isthmus of the cingulate gyrus. And then right behind it, you will find the entrance of P3, drain CSF here, and then you can uh, open uh, your tent, work here in the quadri quadrigeminal plate, and dissect, and then you have your, your entrance. Very, very straightforward. So this is post-op. If we go a little, for a bigger tumor, this is a German um, uh, uh, pinealoblastoma. And I can see here, this is the coming. So the coming is here. So I know that the, the tumor is probably uh, protracting, is, is projecting to the quadrigeminal uh, system here. And it's leaning against the cerebellum. I know this already. So uh, the tumor has made part of my way. So again, always uh, I use this to sustain the cerebellum, the, the, um, the occipital lobe. And then again, I know where I should cut my vein. This is a straight sinus. Remember corpus callosum, come here where you drain. This is basal vein of Rosenthal and the tumor is here leaning against uh, the cerebellum. So after we remove, we can see the whole um, inner surface of the, the third ventricle. Look, uh, whenever you do microsurgery, uh, a, a bloody field is the enemy of microsurgery. So try to keep it as clean as possible. And also you can check what's going on with your retractor. Remember that this, this part, portion here actually is the continuation of the uh, the mesial temporal structures. So you are, if you place your retractor here, you, you are escaping the visual field and try not to keep the retractor uh, much time. So whenever you get uh, enough relaxation, just uh, get rid of the retractor. 
In my 50 cases, I have two cases of uh, 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 transient uh, altera uh, alterations in the visual field. One of them actually was due to a, a hematoma. I don't know what happened. I probably have damaged one of the veins in the back here and thus kept bleeding and the, uh, the patient had a, a small hematoma. I went back and the visual field was restored. And the other one was just uh, a complaint of um, blind spots, small blind spots that after three months had vanished. So uh, no problems, but you have to make sure that you do not, do not damage the, uh, the inner surface. So this is a view uh, after the tumor is being removed. And you can see our way here, all the way. So there's not much retraction. You just have to rely on CSF uh, drainage. And this is post-operative. This is a different tumor. This is a, a, one of the germinomas. Uh, germinomas, uh, sometimes um, when uh, we fail with the radiotherapy or we do not have reliable markers, we go after them. And uh, we have good results by removing uh, germinomas. But germinomas, sometimes small remnants are not a problem, and you can leave them. And uh, the difference is that some germinomas are somewhat harder in, uh, in consistency and, and um, uh, we, we have a, a little bit more difficult difficulties in, in removing them. So this was a, a, a big tumor that I expected to have uh, uh, to retract the cerebellum backwards. So I did a bigger uh, opening of the tent. Again, you see, there's splenium of the corpus callosum. I don't like to operate on the splenium. Um, this, this approach could be used for epilepsy when you have to do perform a posterior callosotomy. This is a straight shot all the way, uh, almost to the genu uh, of the corpus callosum. And uh, I operate in epilepsy also, and I, I usually like to, to do this uh, through this route. So germinoma, sometimes they are tough tumors. Uh, uh, you have to uh, use a lot of uh, ultrasonic aspirators, but you can work on both sides and find the medial posterior parietal arteries and coagulate it. So uh, you have a, a less bloody field. And this is after the tumor has been removed. There's a little remnant here uh, that was, that was uh, too much attached to the um, basal, uh, to the venial galen, so I left it behind. And this is the post-op. Well, those are for small tumors. We can uh, also tackle uh, bigger tumors in this region, as some Dr. Musi showed. And I, I know that Dr. Professor Boba just operated a child in, uh, in Tumen. So most of the times tumors like this, they uh, invade the posterior part of the third ventricle. They displace the structures inside the third ventricle. This is a... Uh, uh, Primitive neuroectodermal tumor is called uh, medullo epithelioma on a three-year-old child. And I decided that I've seen that the tumor had displaced all the structures here. So I thought that the tumor would probably make my way. Uh, and also I could have a better control of this tumor rather than going uh, through the, the sulcus uh, here on the surface, because I would just dive inside the tumor with uh, no uh, uh, control of the bleeding. So this is what we got. Again, left side. This is the view I'm going to go from the sides, from the posterior part up. This is the corpus callosum here. And after we uh, dissect the tumor, the tumor starts uh, uh, protruding outside by itself. And after uh, dissection and suction, we can see the medial wall of the third ventricle on the other side. Those are the veins that were displaced superiorly, vein of Galen. This is the corpus callosum and on this side after complete removal of the tumor, this is cerebellum. The girl did the uh, had an uneventful uh, outcome and she's still alive after two years. Well, this is one thing for us to think. Let's see, uh, if we think about anatomy, 
why would we position this uh, glioma here? This is a grade one glioma, and it is in the depths of the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure, right underneath or below, I would say, of the quadrigenal plate on the central lobule. So in the midline central lobule of the, the vermis, uh, if we go infratentorial supracerebellar, we have to go this way and then go down here. Or sometimes we have to go this way, make a midline incision in the vermis and tackle the tumor right there. So the best way to come is from above, straight shot from above. And we can see it in the surgery. So we decided to uh, um, tackle the tumor this way. Again, left side, this is uh, the cumin. I know that the tumor is right here at the central lobule. This is still the arachnoid. We can see by transparency the, um, the precentral cerebellar vein. This is vein of Galen, base of vein of Rosenthal. So after I have a little bleeding here, a small artery I just stained my whole operative field. I, I felt really bad about this, but uh, you know, I, you, sometimes you just have to look the other way. And this is the precentral cerebellar vein that I would cut. And then I can work. This is a quadrigenal plate. This is the uh, angle between um, the, I forgot the labule here, the central labule and the quadri quadrigenal plate. Working with the section and the bipolar and the um, ultrasonic aspirator. We end up with this, and uh, this is the posterior, uh, the superior part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. And then this is pre and this is post op So electing the cases, uh, the route is very, very important. Again, just to show uh, a little bit more experience and try to uh, put together with the anatomy. If we look here on the brainstem, this is peduncle, this is the, uh, posterior, uh, the sulcus, the posterior sulcus here, um, any of the lateral, mes the lateral mesencephalic sulcus here. So I know that this lesion here is right there at the posterior, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. So for me to get oriented in this region, I could use the basal vein of Rosenthal, follow the vein of the posterior lateral sulcus, the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, and I would be there. And again, if you look, if we go transtentorial, as a straight shot to the tumor. So the tumor will be located here in the anatomy, as Dr. Musi showed, base of vein of Rosenthal, lateral mesencephalic sulcus and the vein of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. So if I approach laterally, I know this is, again, splenium, straight sinus. This is a venous lake. This is a transverse sinus, and just by releasing CSF, I can see the base of vein of Rosenthal. This is part of the peduncle and quadrigeminal plates, and the tumor is protruding here. Let's open the tent. After opening the tent, we flip it superiorly, and we end up with the tumor right here. Again, it's is a pilocytic astrocytoma, and look at the position of my hands. Imagine you operating on the right side, it's impossible to use this angle here. You have to go and tilt your hand like this, like you were uh, having a meal on an airplane. And this is post op. Again, this is another tumor I operated last week. And again, take advantage of the anatomy. This is uh, internal cerebral veins, vein of Galen. Precentral cerebellar vein. The precentral cerebellar vein is in front of the tumor. So this has to be related to the quadrigeminal plate, to the mesencephalon, to the upper part of the pons here. So I know that I, I will find this inside the brainstem. And this is a pilocytic astrocytoma. So the tumor would be here. Remember, precentral cerebellar vein, basal vein of Rosenthal. If I open here, the tumor should be here. And then what we did, left side, 
if the tumor was on the other side, of course, I would operate on the right side, but it's not. So I open through the side to the left side. This will go up. And that's the tumor here. I'm about to finish. Let me see how, see if I have a... Uh, uh, please, so continue, please, continue. please continue, please continue. Please continue, okay? continue. No limit, no, no limit. Ah, okay. No limit for you. Please continue. Very interesting, oh. very interesting. Okay, very so interesting. Uh, look here. So after we open this uh, gap here, we see the brainstem is enlarged and the veins are on the back. So the precentral cerebellar vein would be around here. I cannot see it, but this is the window I need for this type of tumor. So this is uh, the situation uh, with a picture taken from outside, not through the microscope, and the tumor is already here. So you just have to follow the tumor um, and uh, you will be there. Again, always, always look at this. The first thing, when you place your retractor, come here, find the corpus callosum. Go a little bit down and you see the issues of the cingulates. And then here you drain your CSF. No need for lumbar drain. And then place your retractor like that, just to sustain, not to depress the brain. And you open this direction here from inferior to anterior. And then after we uh, remove everything, the cerebellum falls on top again. And that's the hole we have. And uh, there you go in the post-operative uh, view. One thing I, I didn't mention is that I always like to operate on the tumors directly before placing any uh, CSF shunt, because most of the times, and this is a vast majority of the times, the CSF circulation is restored and you do not need to place a, a, a VP shunt, okay? Try first. I, I always use this also for the tumors in the posterior fossa. We have the, the, the chance to operate on a lot of posterior fossa tumors in my institution. And I always like to uh, operate first and then if necessary, place a CSF uh, shunt. Most of the times they, they, uh, they restore the CSF circulation. And this is the post-op. And this is, you can see, the way and look at the brain parenchyma. There's no damage. Always try to uh, go through the natural pathways. Never uh, place the retractor to retract, just to sustain, and uh, the results will be good. Now I'm gonna just talk a little bit what I think because uh, I've heard some of the speakers talk, and uh, I, I think I share the same idea with uh, Professor Borba, and. Um, the semi CT position is, first of all, is, is very, uh, it's not a comfortable one. And second thing is that whenever you want to go uh, super cerebellar infratentorial, besides having to sacrifice veins, sometimes the, uh, there are other veins uh, uh, other than the um, uh, vermian and uh, ventricular inferior, uh, inferior hemispheric veins that drain to lakes very important lakes sometimes, and you have uh, uh, problems with bleeding, uh, you need to have a CSF uh, release to have uh, the cerebellum fall by gravity. If you make a craniotomy that is too small, there's no place for you to release CSF prior uh, to anything, and the bone will sustain the cerebellum, and you have to place much more retraction on top. So. I usually open or even either open wide or go all the way down to find a place to drain CSF at the cisterna magna uh, when I wanna go this way here. And um, another uh, uh, criticism that I have on the going lateral is that if you place retraction here and you have a damage of either of the bridging veins here, it's very difficult to control if you don't have them exposed. So in my opinion, I've used for a few times uh, the lateral supercerebellar. I usually go a little bit more towards the side so that I can see all the veins that are bridging. And there's another problem. Uh, sometimes when you place the, your patient and you have the CSF uh, drained, you can end up with uh, uh, pneumocephalus. 
In was sometimes is uh, it's okay. They he absorb after a while, but sometimes they uh, they uh, they have uh, seizures coming with it. I had patients with uh, difficult to control seizures due to the frontal retraction, and this is okay with the young subjects. But in older subjects, you can end up with uh, hematomas because if you have a uh, pneumocephalus and the brain, the bridging veins are torn you end up with hematomas. So not a good, uh, besides the problems with air embolism that everybody knows. So after coagulating the veins, we can either go towards the side if the tumor goes more to, towards the slope of the, the um, cerebellum mesencephalic fissure, or we go on top of the cumin, depending on the case. This is what Dr. Musi has already explained. And we need retraction to go down on the quadrigeminal plate. And this is the way we end up uh, at this region. This is an example. One tumor that was operated this way in the time uh, I, I was with Dr. Evandro. Look at the date here, 96. So yeah, I'm old. So this is the tentorial edge here on both sides, the basal veins of Rosenthal, precentral cerebellar vein that has been coagulated and the tumor down here. Uh, Dr. Javier has shown beautiful um, views of the, this region after removal of the tumor. And that's what you can see. This is massa intermediate. This is the roof of the third ventricle. Post-op. Let me show you another one. There's a bigger tumor. Same. Look at this. This is straight shot here. We can go super cerebellar. This is a good. I have no uh, question that uh, towards the midline, you have both walls of the third ventricle on, on, on your view. Um, going back to the uh, other approach that I was showing previously, I don't see a problem of reaching to the other side. So people say, oh, it's very bad. You cannot see on the other side. It's not true. You can see it and uh, you can open the tent if you want to and go to the, the other side. But uh, the major advantage of this is, is that it puts you in the midline and this is a good uh, uh, approach. So this is post-op, a little old, but it's okay. Then again, I operated a similar case and this is a covernoma from above. Interhemispheric transtentorium. Look at the cerebellum. It gives you a hint where the lesion is uh, located. I like to use the cumin and the anterior portion of the quadrangular lobule to show me where I am. But I know that this covernoma is right here in the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. It's the same way. So if I come from a lateral perspective, I can find the basal vein of Rosenthal, look for the vein, and this will lead me exactly there. But if I don't have it, I place a, 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 a neural navigation device and it's easy now. And then look at what we're gonna end up here. So I come lateral on the surface of the cerebellum, look uh, for the basal vein of Rosenthal, a little bit more anterior here. I see this staining and the vein on top. And I can operate on the covernoma, and this is post-operative. This was done by Professor Oliveira. Now, just to finish uh, the presentation, I wanna show um, one case that really uh, bothered me for a while, because uh, I had to think and look at the, the picture to decide what to do. So this is um, uh, ependymoma that probably had its origin in the fourth ventricle and went all the way up in the aqueduct all the way to fill the third ventricle. If we look careful, carefully here, you see that the quadrigeminal plate is here. So if I go this way, interhemispheric transtentorial, first, that would be very difficult to make this curve here and also, uh, Coming from the side, I would probably have to traverse the superior cerebellar peduncle. If I come uh, this way to remove this part, uh, that's a long way, have to open the, uh, the choroidal fissure and I would just be able to remove a little bit of this. If I go this way, uh, uh, opening the splenium, I would face the veins here and right underneath, 
I would have the quadrennial plate. It's forbidden. So I decided to do a different way. So first of all, I tackled the tumor in two settings. The first one, I used uh, a televelo tonsillar approach through the occipital suboccipital surface. And this is the tumor in another view, filling the third ventricle and the whole thing here. So I started here and could remove this much of the tumor. And then again, I had the, the doubt, how can I approach this? So for me, the best way would be uh, to look at the anatomy and you see this is a straight shot this way, but how can I enter here? as the quadrigeminal plate is on top. So if I look at the anatomy, look, there's the tumor that was left. We look at the anatomy. So I would have to go probably on top here of the vermis, go down on the quadrigeminal plate and look for this, the superior cerebellar pedunculus on each side and look at the lingula. The lingula covers the inferior part, I mean, the superior part of the roof of the fourth ventricle. So if I remove the lingula here, I would be coming below the colliculi on each side. And this would probably be a safe way as the, the quadrigeminal plate, you remember, let me go back, was tilted superiorly. So if I open this way, I would probably be able to get there. But uh, again, I come to another problem, I don't like the semi-sitting position. So how can I place my patient? So what I did, and this goes really well for young subjects, because uh, uh, when you have a big guy here, it's difficult uh, to position yourself. So I place my patient very close to the edge of the table. Uh, I always put the left side down. Remember, I'm right-handed, so my my hand has to come on top of the right shoulder so that I'm free to operate. I tilt the head as much as I can. And this was the previous surgery. We go a little bit more up so that I can have the uh, sinus exposed. And then that's the position I have. This is the precentral cerebellar vein. I go down here, try to uh, operate where the tumor is protruding inferiorly. We knew that it was, uh, it could be seen by transparency. And then I could operate this way and uh, remove the whole thing. So uh, there's a lot, thank you very, very much for your attention. There's a lot we can discuss and I hope we can do it uh, after the next time. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tadeshe. It's really brilliant, brilliant lectures. A lot of, lot of, lot of knowledge we receive. Not only for young, even for me, it's a, a very interesting. So no limit for you. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you very much again. I open you for me and for my center. <laughs> thank you, Professor Borba. Thank you. I hope we are, we are, will be close friend in the future. Okay. It's, it's really because. I know personally your mentor, Oliveira, come to my place. We make a lot of surgery, a lot of dissection, and we sorry drink a lot of vodka together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, Oliveira, is a really strong a neurosurgeon, really strong personality. It's very important in combining one man. So we always remember, remember this guy. Uh, so I hope for the future friendship. I hope. And okay, I see sure. the level of the lectures. It's really, really, really great. Thank you very much. But for me, it's a little bit difficult to give lecture after some giant of final vision <laughs> tumor surgeons. It's really difficult for us because we do not have such a lot of experience like you, uh, like, uh, like Antonio and uh, Javier. But uh, we have some new technologies in my, in my center some new technologies. And I want to, to show the possibility of new technology in surgery of this kind of uh, difficult, ch really challenge uh, 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 place for neurosurgeon. So why I want to introduce uh, our small personal experience in the 
Uh, I want to introduce our small personal experience about it's not, it's not full. Not full. Okay. Uh, personal experience in end and exoscopic uh, surgical treatment of pinea pineal uh, lesions. Lesions. Uh, so not this. Presentation. Okay. No. 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 Sorry, sorry. Some technical problem. Just to play. Okay. Just to play now. No, no. Stop sharing and share again. Sorry, one moment, one moment. There was some technical problem. Your zoom is off? I don't know. I don't know. O computador dele tá em... Não dá para ajudar, né? Não, isso aqui tá tudo em russo. Ele não dá para ajudar. As carecas, tio, o que aconteceu? Não, caiu. Que isso aí? Na pé, cabeça. Eu tudo. tudo. Tá parecendo quando eu fui treinar com dolentes, cortei o cabelo baixo e tava quantos graus abaixo de zero, as orelhas quebravam assim no frio. Ready? Okay. 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 Maybe now it's okay. Maybe now it's okay. I hope. Sorry. So why uh, our lecture is about uh, and uh, an exoscopic surgical treatment of final lesions. Uh, we now see the evaluation of intraoperative imaging device in neurosurgery. So we started uh, loop, for example, when we introduce microscope, simple microscope, and more more uh, more, more complex, more combined. Uh, 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 microscope when we uh, introduce exoscope and now we uh, uh, we, we see now uh, the introducing of the new, uh, completely new device like an exoscope in in neurosurgery so exoscope the uh, have some content some uh, main important is uh, uh, exoscope uh, head you see and also we have the light source, the camera controller, and the uh, handed control. And also all image we see on the screen by the glass in 3D, in 3D imaging. Again, if you see the, the exoscope, uh, uh, you see the, the main important is the uh, two, 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 two lens just for 3D and the also for light cable, just for lighting, lighting the, the operating fire. Also very important is the uh, handle of the this exoscope. Uh, we use in our place this mechanical, like a uh, Mitaka, uh, Mitaka handle, air handle, because it's very useful to just to move the exoscope immediately and very precise uh, during the surgery. It's very important. 
Also, uh, you must uh, be very familiar with the handle controller because the focus, zoom, moving, uh, small moving uh, during the near the uh, uh, exist area is you uh, managed by this handle controller. Photo also. So uh, now we understand some advantages of 3D exoskeletal neurosurgery. You see, the uh, most important for our patients is the ergonomic comfort for the surgeon. Especially, it's very important in the surgery in the final uh, final tumor, final region. So lack lack of having a fault and control for uh, posture, ability to have a relaxed posture and horizontal. Uh, uh, Gaze versus flexed head and neck position uh, for the surgeon. Uh, first, surgical assistant also being able to comfortably assist during the procedure without having, uh, without having the adduced position based on the surgical position by a lack of operation microscope. Uh, high degree of the depth perception. Uh, does it consume the large footprint and operation uh, room space? compared to microscope and so on. And uh, also it's very useful in our opinion, the educational possibility for training opportunities for the operation of staff, residents and students. And also, uh, we see ability to see uh, all surgical field and rapidly to switch from micro to micro, to, uh, micro, micro to micro vision. Ability to scrap notes to participate in more active procedure. Also very important in our, uh, our vision is the lead-based illumination because uh, lead-based illumination is less heat than the operation microscope with halogen, halogen lighting. Also very important is the uh, uh, vision because uh, 4K high definition monitor is very important, especially in uh, tumor surgery because we must differentiate the color uh, that's to different uh, tumor from the brain. Uh, also, telescope is distant from the operative field uh, uh, and allows a great, uh, great visualization during the procedure and uh, use more efficient use the some surgical instruments. Also, it's very important in the in the pineal tumor region surgery because uh, in pineal tumor region we use the long instrument, long instrument. So. Sometimes when you use the microscope, it's very difficult to introduce the uh, instrument inside of the operation field. And also very important, <laughs> because uh, also very important in pineal tumor region, uh, lack of the need of the lens fogging and cleaning, because uh, uh, we know the, the in, in deep in deep and narrow access is sometimes a uh, problem. And uh, for surgeon, for surgeon, Again, it's very important because it's surgeon, uh, because the final region tumor so is a very not a short procedure. This is a long procedure if you want to operate it carefully and safely. So why the less excessive harmful light exposure to the eye of the surgeon? So we, we save the surgeon eyes by use this technology. Also very very use very important uh, adventures in our opinion. Of course, of course, this technology is uh, new, is uh, rapidly developed and uh, have some limitations. There are some limitations. Uh, for our opinion, the opinion from the literature, there are some limitations we, we, you uh, see in our slide. And the most important for us is, um, um, is uh, no, uh, no real freehand uh, device. It's a little bit, little bit, uh, uh, different uh, for surgeon to, to move because uh, mainly assistant assistant moves the uh, the microscope. So uh, most limitations for surgeons you must have very experienced uh, very experienced uh, assistant. Just uh, this assistant must must know, know very well the step of the procedure and uh, what a surgeon to want uh, during the surgery because manual reposition during the exoscope. Uh, of the scope during the process is it difficult, sometimes difficult, and then long, longer time than the microscope. Microscope. Uh, again, another limitation is the learning curve and adaptive period required to the develop coordination and familiarity with the system. Sometimes 
rare, but sometimes it's possible. Possible vertigo headache uh, from the uh, prolonged use of the three D glass, glasses. And uh, 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 light stores sometimes requires additional lighting because not enough, not enough. Sometimes uh, it's also very actual in the pineal surgeon, uh, in the pineal region surgery. Sometimes it is uh, not enough uh, light source uh, by uh, exoscope, and it needs some additional lighting. And sometimes not very useful. Also, we combine uh, our uh, exoscope with a uh, 3D endoscope assistant for the surgical intervention in the pineal region. So why is the, uh, um, especially is very important for the uh, uh, posterior fossa, uh, posterior fossa surgery. Uh, because uh, a very important neurovascular structure uh, in very deep and very narrow uh, place located in the final final uh, uh, region, so it's, uh, it's 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 very dangerous to to, to damage the structure. So why is the additional field endoscope visualizations uh, also uh, give us more safety and more possibilities in this kind of surgery? Uh, <clears throat> so hemostasis control, control of totality uh, totally to totality of the removal of the lesions. Uh, reducing the risk of the postoperative complications also very useful in, in, by the 3D endoscopic assistance, in our opinion. Uh, so why uh, the new equipment we need also, not only 3D exoscope, also we have uh, combined in our surgery, in this uh, final uh, lesions uh, surgery, we combine by 3D and neuroendoscopy. Not, uh, not only uh, exoscope, also 3D uh, neuroendoscope. So in this, this, uh, by this purpose, we use the uh, 3D endoscope uh, for, from Vision Sense, uh, Vision Sense company. And uh, this endoscope gives us a possibility of stereo vision technology. And you see the, our operation room with this, uh, this uh, uh, 3D endoscope, you see the 3D endoscope, and 3D endoscope has a uh, uh, out uh, diameter is, um, uh, near the six millimeters, and uh, have and has a working canal, working canal, and canal for irrigation, for lighting, and this is a 3D camera, 3D camera, and this is a, a camera and light in our operation room from uh, from this in the scope from this vision cells. Again, about, about, uh, about uh, modern minimally invasive surgery, uh, which use uh, some uh, exo-endoscopic systems. Before, uh, endoscope is uh, like a, uh, like a pirate, you know, because uh, uh, 2D endoscopy and 2D visualization is uh, like one hand and one, one eye pirate, you see? And the scopist just use, use only one instrument and see by one eye, no by, by binocular uh, vision. So now the possibility of 3D endoscopy and 3D exoscope give us the completely new level of in neurosurgery, new level in neurosurgery, because now we have binocular, uh, binocular uh, uh, vision, and it gives us possibility for bimanual manipulation. So like a samurai, like a samurai. Uh, newest neurosurgeon. And uh, in this slide, I, I, I present our experience now uh, about 3D exoscope in neurosurgery. And now we have near the, uh, more than 80 surgical cases, near the 100 cases, and there's the, uh, um, a lot of indications possible for this kind of surgery. You see there is a tumor, mainly this tumor, uh, more than uh, near the 50 cases, uh, mic uh, microsurgery, chiari malformation, a lot of also, uh, um, microvascular decompression is in, in functional neurosurgery is possible, very useful for the fascia, for the chageminal nerve, with endoscopic assistance, and and exoscopic surgery. Um, very interesting and very perspective, I think, in the epilepsy surgery, just for removal for focal cortical dysplasia, 
uh, uh, we have as experience of vascular surgery, just uh, clipping of aneurysm, cavernomas, removal of IVM, and bypass surgery. Also, this possible. We have experience uh, with uh, this kind of surgery. So, pineal region is still very difficult and still very challenged place for the neurosurgeon. You see the anatomical uh, anatomical uh, anatomical um, uh, specimen. So I don't explain a lot of about anatomy because the previous uh, uh, lectures is beautiful, really brilliant. So just only show the how challenge is the place, very, uh, very deep and very, a lot of a lot of uh, vascular, uh, many both vascular and uh, nervous uh, components inside. And I want to show our experience, start to say experience about the pineal tumor uh, region surgery. You see the information about the patients so with the pineal tumors. This is a patient near the 50 years old, a standard, standard, uh, standard situation uh, of uh, uh, complaints, anamnesis, and so on. I, uh, it's really uh, these patients really come to my place in very difficult in very difficult condition. Many many is depend from the hydrocephalus. Many depends from hydrocephalus. You see, uh, big hydrocephalus. So why big tumor in pineal region? Uh, so why at first step we receive to make a, a restore the say, say, circulation and take biopsy and actually decrease the tumor volume. So we prepare some navigation uh, planning. And in this kind, you see the navigation planning. And you see the, uh, how it's difficult sometimes to choose the trajectory for this kind of uh, first step. Uh, you see that this first step, uh, first trajectory, for example, it's very ideal for the uh, Tumor manipulation, tumor biopsy, but it's uh, difficult, difficult to make uh, ETV. So this uh, red red line is uh, ideal trajectory. Ah, this one, yeah, sorry. Uh, this red one is very ideal for the ETV, but it's a little bit difficult to reach uh, the place uh, of the, where the pineal tumor location. So uh, sometimes we uh, sometimes we use some. Uh, um, uh, some med uh, medial place between uh, it's give us possibility to uh, make to reach the tumor and to, to create the ETV. But it depends from the uh, Monroe's size. If Monroe's size is enough, this is ideal. Uh, it's, it's it's enough. If uh, Monroe's size is very narrow, so sometimes we use uh, not rigid. We use combined. Uh, rigid on uh, or flexible on the scope just to make a TV and in and, and uh, uh, tumor biopsy in one session. But sometimes it's it, it really difficult places we use we create two bar hole and we create two trajectories. Not and if not possible in white in, in one trajectory middle. Uh, so for this kind of surgery, uh, I show my our operation roof uh, because we need really uh, high level equipment for this kind of surgery so uh, for example we must have the brain lab navigation system brain lab navigation system with uh, a monitor for disposable video scope uh, you see the disposable the scope using with the laser with the laser because um, uh, because uh, Metronic, uh, Metronic, uh, Metronic company produce this kind of uh, uh, video scope, this possible video scope, and inside it's possible to put laser, laser. Uh, endoscopic, uh, some endoscopic equipment. Uh, also, we we need, and we need also for uh, uh, 3D endoscopic stand for the uh, uh, also for the exoscope. Also, we have the Mitaka holders, and also very important, we must have the some FK FK 3D monitor for the ICG if, if, if necessary. And of course, uh, 3D endoscope also. So all this equipment you see in this uh, in this uh, slide. Again, again, 
Uh, this is a step by step how we made ETV. This is the trajectory, we choose the bar hole. And now we start uh, to show the 3D neuroendoscopy for ETV. You see the, the, the advantages of the 3D neuroendoscopy. How wide the view of the angle uh, of 3D endoscopy? No compare with the standard 2D. No compare. And you see very uh, wide angle, very wide angle, it's very good quality. This is a Monroe, this is a chord plexus, and we go now inside of the third ventricle. You see interthalamic uh, adhesions. This is posterior part of the tumor. You see this is uh, the tumor of the pineal region, mammary body, primary recessus, and you see the how thin, how thin is the bottom, and you see the, this is a uh, basilar artery, basilar artery, and P1, P2. First one we create the ETV, just to restore circulation. I, I choose the place, safe place, just before the uh, uh, basilar artery, and open by the dex forceps the flow of the fluid ventricle. And then I uh, delayed the, uh, the fenestration by the Fogarty catheter. Two camera, two camera, for a special two camera Fogarty catheter. It's very easy to create, to widen the, the fenestration. Now open very well. You see the, the fenestration. This is the flow of the ventricle, mammary body, uh, basal artery, and the fenestration work very good. You see a good rotation of the edge. After we just to see the possibility of the manipulator on the tumor. And I choose the trajectory above on, or maybe here, under, under the interthalamic adhesions. And I choose under. Now we see the, the tumor, and now we start uh, to create the big uh, piece for the biopsy by, uh, laser, by, by the laser finister, by the laser vaporization. Because if you use standard photos uh, for biopsy for endoscopy, it's very small, very small, uh, very small pieces. So I, sometimes you create big pieces by, uh, uh, by the laser vaporization. And we use in this kind of surgery special, special laser. It's a, not tip on the tip, it's on the side. It's, it's on the side of the laser. You see the special? This is uh, on the side. So it's very easy to cut and very easy to vaporize uh, the tumor. It's just, you just only rotate. Only rotate, not need to move it. So it's uh, higher, uh, higher uh, safety of manipulation is possible with this kind of uh, laser. And now we see the uh, by three uh, uh, um, um, ICG and the illumination, the tumor. Okay. Okay. And uh, this is the result after operation. This is the uh, most uh, maybe half of the tumor is vaporized and take for biopsy and you create a TV and this is uh, how it's uh, on, uh, and not, not, now we prepare the, it, we take sometimes just the patient improve his condition and now we go to the step two of surgical intervention with uh, we uh, totally removed uh, surgically 
and the neurophysiological control uh, by 3D exoscope and endoscope assistance and ICG control. The uh, lesion in the final region, the tumor of the final region. And in this slide, you see uh, the, the, the advantages of the exoscope. Uh, it's possible to, 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 to create the trajectory completely, completely close to the, to the spine, to, to the spine, back of the, back of the neck, you see? Just a parallel possible to make the parallel of the, of the, the surface of the uh, cerebellum. So uh, no need, no need the uh, more retraction of the cerebellum, it's very important. My microscope is not possible like this. Microscope to see like this, maximum. By exoscope, it's no limit, no limit, you see. Uh, this is the position of the patient before the operation. Some landmass on the skin, just to make the uh, skin incision. <coughs> and you see how it's uh, easy and how it's beautiful a visualization on the monitor, uh, 4K monitor uh, uh, from the from the exoscope. How is the angle? It's a very wide angle, and very beautiful quality of the picture. Okay, okay. Uh, now I we show the second step. Nossa, que perfeição de imagem. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, okay. And we create some barcode. I may be a little bit fast and then create the no, flap. Huh? Okay. Uh, we create the, the flap and we open the dura. And you see our uh, main landmark on the dura. And now we open the dura. Just cut the dura, ligate the occipital sinus, and open the area. This is the uh, all the end, what we, we discussed before. Uh, first one, we create the some ultrasound control before the operation. You see the very nice is the tumor. Yeah. And uh, uh, when we start to dissect, you see the magnification, the brilliant magnification, the brilliant illumination, and it's possible, uh, really, uh, very fine dissection is possible. Very fine, you see. All arachnoid, all vessels. Really precise dissection is possible in this very challenging place. You see the vein above. Because of the because of the trajectory of the scope is give us possibility without any traction of the cerebellum. Visualize this area with very big magnification. You see. Very easy to, to dissect now because you see all structures. You see how we dissect the vein from above. It's not really okay. Huh? Oh, okay, so. The lateral dissection. Huh? Lateral dissection, horizontal veins, because tumor is so big, so why we maybe dissect a little bit more? Elder, the video is running. You can still running. Yes, or step yes. By step? Huh? it is running. It is running. But is it step by step or? Yeah, running? like uh, yeah, it's not running continuously. It's truncated. It's Okay. Goes picture by picture. Okay, sorry, sorry, but it's maybe technical, some problem. And now we dissect all and we remove 
what why why one piece This is after removing. When we create the control by uh, uh, ICG to just to see the vessel main is the wind. This is safe. No disrupt. It's very important in this kind of surgery. This is by en by endoscope. Endoscope. And if you see the remnants. Also, remnants of the tumor, no remnants. This is after operation, after total removal. Again, check. Very easy to check by, by endoscope. And now close the field, surgical field. This is after operation, total, total removing. Before, after. This is uh, histology, it's meta studies uh, from uh, renal localization. Case two is a pineal gland cyst also. The some uh, boy, 15 years old, um, complaint from the severe headache, diseases sometimes in coordination and sleep disturbance. So why we decide to operate this one and uh, we also uh, not understand this cyst or tumor so why so uh, during the operation we want to have some biopsy. Nystagmus also. This is before the operation, the, 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 two, the Lesion, big cyst, and lesions here in pineal region. Uh, this is a view of the our uh, operation room before the surgery. The position of the surgeon very comfortable, and position of the monitor. Patient position, landmark on the skin. Okay, skin incision. You see how brilliant the image. It's an unbelievable image. Dissect the muscle. Create the, create the bone flap. Open the dura, and you see the landmark. Now open the dura. Open the dura, and you see the surface of the cerebellum, main vein. Now I start to dissect. Now we open the posterior wall of the arachnoid cyst. This is tentorium. Now open the arachnoid, drain some CSF, just to relax the, just to relax the cerebrum, and open the window, the road. Now you see the fenestration of the cyst, very easy. No retract the cerebrum because the trajectory of the exoscope visualization give us this possibility. Again, you see illumination and magnification and quality of the picture of the color because uh, 4K. So it give us possibility to dissect very safely because I see all structures very well. Even 
such dangerous structure like a VIN is possible to dissect. No microscope give us such possibility. We finish straight. We dissect the precentral vein, open the cyst and take biopsy. We preserve all drainage vein because it's very important and strength the this vein by the sponge line. Now we close the wall, close the door. This is after operation. It's the place of biopsy, this decrease in the size, this is MRI after. This is gastology, this is cyst, not tumor. And third case, what I want to, and last case I want to see is about meningioma of cerebellar tentorium, which uh, invasive the rectus sinus. It's not easy, easy case for us. This is uh, the MRI before you see, very adherent to the rectus, to the uh, gallium. Again, this is the operation room, exoscope, position of the patient, navigation, and the monitor. Position. The landmark by navigation systems, you see, before the operation, this is a trajectory and estimate is approach is enough, not enough. And also we use the ultrasound just to estimate main vessels like a vein, artery before surgery, you see. And they make, make fusion by MRI during surgery. Now start the surgery. Super cerebellar infratentorial approach. There is the flap. Cut the dura, cut the occipital sinus. But this, in this case, is visible difficult because a lot of lot of vein close the road. And I want to, to save this vein. So why I a little bit uh, uh, limited in this kind of surgery because I really want to try to, to preserve the vein. But exoscope give me this possibility. Because I moved the head of the exoscope in any, any trajectory, what I need also. Tumor, you start to move the tumor. In this, in, because a lot of lot of veins, so in, in this kind of surgery, I do open very widely. I hope for my exoscope, <laughs> give me possibility to remove. You see the vein, I dissect the tumor. Very precisely dissect possible, very safely. If you, you, you show the Place very well, so you're not afraid to dissect. And then I removed, go inside, a little bit decrease in the, the bulking, and then dissect, and then remove by block. Again, to put some hemostatis because not, not, not want to coagulate more. And then again, uh, put, uh, I save the vein and uh, put uh, some fungus around to strengthen the vein wall, like this. 
all VN ISF in this surgery. This is after operation. I see totally near the total removing, near the total removing, checked by interoperative ICG about the VN. You see, all VN is safe. And this is after operation. Practically total. This is main geoma, great one. So conclusion, we have a lot of adventures, we have uh, uh, disadventures, we need some develop of this technology, of course, uh, uh, combined with 3D endoscopic is uh, really also have adventures, uh, but uh, need learning proof of surgeons, this kind of technology. So why we have the cadaver lab. Thank you, Professor Boba, who introduced us in this uh, kind of surgery, and we now cooperate in part of the exoscopic surgery together. You see the state of dissection by exoscope uh, in our cadaver lab. Thank you for your attention. We welcome for the for the cooperation in part of education. If some people want to train in our place and for uh, scientific operation also. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sutanov, Professor Robert, for the brilliant presentation. Musi Elder, I think you have more than seven people online, until online, people is in Instagram and, and also on Facebook. Uh, I wanna show just, one picture, see? One of the biggest problems to approach the area is sometimes we use the sitting position. Can you see my screen here? Yes. Yes. Look here. This is the case that I, I can show the very, very fast. This was the case in a young boy, a talent lesion, okay? We put in city position. Look how comfortable I am in surgery. It's different when you use the microscope. That you have your hands like this, long, you cannot see well. See, a long time surgery, long, it's difficult to manage, and you and you be tired. If the exoscope, see, the camera is here. It's like the microscope is here and you can move it very easy. And you can go closer also to the patient and to the surgical field. You can use short instruments, completely different. But I think that still there is some problem with the exoscope. One of the problem is the light in the deep area. See, yeah. if the field is, is wide, have better light, but if the field is, is small, the light yet uh, is not enough. I believe that with the improvement of the exoscope, you have this visualization much, much better. I did, in I came in October here, when we start this idea to use the exoscope. They had the exoscope before, but are not using so often. From October down to February, yeah. they did almost 100 cases of exoscope surgery. Yeah. <laughs> I think now Professor Sufyanov has one of the most experienced in exoscope in the world. And I think it's, it's, it's a good idea when you want to use the super cerebellar infratentorial approach to use the exoscope. The big problem is that that work like this, with the microscope. See? In, in two hours, you'll be like this. If long instrument, your hand, your instrument to be like this. See? But this, I saw the beautiful presentation of, 
of Elder and, and, and Musi and Javier to show that terms territorial approach is more comfortable. See? But you don't have the same view that you have from the midline. Huh? On the midline, you can have, uh, maybe you have a better view to the other side. I don't know if you can get this, can comment something. Go ahead, Elder. Antonio, um, please. Please go ahead. <laughs> Fala aí, ó. Uh, oh, Okay. You want, you want to I think the, the drawback of the transcentorial interhemispheric occipital is uh, the ipsilateral side, not the contralateral. The contralateral is very, very nicely approached. You can see uh, operating through the left side, you can see yeah. easily Our all side. the things on the right. But uh, on the same side, uh, the vein of uh, Rosenthal, it uh, really hampers the, the exposure. It's, uh, it's not so easy to retract the, the basal vein of Rosenthal. That's why I said that the best place um, uh, to place your microscope is uh, along the occipital pole. I mean, coming from uh, a almost midline trajectory. You go uh, parallel to the, to the fox in that, that position. And then you can see a little bit better. But the problem is, is still is ipsilateral. Uh, but most of the times, you know, you can manage uh, the ipsilateral side. And if you had a, I have never used that. I use uh, sometimes small mirrors to check on the, my ipsilateral side. But if I had an endoscope, a micro endoscope, that would be uh, a good help, I think. Musi. We'll can you say something? Uh, I agree with uh, Elder. Uh, when you have infratentorial view, you can see the, the tumor and the thalamus uh, on both sides, and you can dissect much more easier than uh, from above. Also, uh, the other advantage that I, I think uh, is that as the tumor pushes the veins upward, when you go from below, you debulk the tumor and you have to deal with the vein on uh, the end of, the, of your surgery. Uh, whereas when you go through the occipital transtentorial approach, you have the vein more on your uh, field of view. I don't know if Elder agrees, but... You like it? Oh. Infratentorial more than the supertentorial, Musa, no? <laughs> Me? No. Uh, well, for usually when I have a, a small tumor uh, that you can do with both approaches, I, I now use the infratentorial supracerebellar approach more often than the, the, the occipital transcentorial. Javier? Okay, I have no uh, this experience, this this the, the, the same experience of this uh, this uh, um, big, big pieces of the neurosurgery. But uh, I have I am very surprised about the the white field you you get with the transtensorial the the transtensorial approach, especially when you open the falx uh, over the the straight sinus and you have both views, the ipsilateral and contralateral side. I'm I'm very surprised of the great presentation, the great lecture of the, um, Dr. Um, the, the Desi. So, uh, but obviously, probably all the neurosurgeons have more experience with the uh, midline, supracellular and infratentorial approach, because I, th I think the orientation is better. You are more comfortable with same same with a symmetric uh, anatomy and with the venous complex located superiorly. Uh, look, the venous complex is always superior. So uh, unless you operate on cases like Musi uh, just told us, but um, it's not a matter of dealing with the venous complex on the superior portion, because even if you operate on the infratentorial, uh, I mean, uh, the interhemispheric transtentorial, still the venous complex are the top part of your exposure. This is the, the, the roof of your exposure. Um, 
the, the thing is that some people, I mean, most of the surgeons are more comfortable operating through a midline, so they see both sides. But it's a matter of getting used to, you know? When you get used to, it's the same. Really, it's the same. And uh, you probably uh, misunderstood. Dr. Musi uh, presented the opening of the, the, the forks to go to the other side. Uh, it, um, it's okay uh, to do that when you have a meningioma uh, in, in the fox and uh, going also to the tent on both sides. It's okay to open to have a, a very good view on the other side. But I, I don't see the usefulness of um, uh, opening the, the fox to look at the other side because you would have to open the fox and then again open the tent on the other side to see what you're looking underneath the tent. So if the tumor is just below the tent, there's no need to do that, I think, in my opinion, in my experience. But uh, on the meningiomas, um, sometimes opening the foxes is, is, uh, is a good trick and uh, it puts you right on the spot. So I think it, it, it's useful for that kind of approach. Uh, Elder, did you have some problem with infarct of occipital lobe and venous infarct or for venous, the occipital internal vein or uh, for the surgical position? I, it's almost I 50 cases because, now, uh, never had one, Barbara. No, no, I uh, remember yeah. a case, uh. a professor of Fernando Braga from Brazil, he had a lot of experience in pineal tumor and he used a similar, uh, similar approach, he was doing very well. And remember a case he always shows in, in the meeting, uh, they put in position and they, ele and they elevate like this, the lateral. See what's happening, the, the roll that they put under the, uh, the Baba, shoulder. you're not on the yeah. screen. Huh? I, can, I cannot no, see you. Not on the screen. Screen. Uh, on the screen. On the screen. You're not on the screen, you're on the side. I cannot see you. Oh, I'm there. Oh, it's interesting. My, uh, I can only see Professor Sufyanov. <laughs> no, no, no. There is another screen that I'm on. Look at, look at the side. No, I cannot see that. That's okay. Okay, I can come. Oh. I can come here. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you no, no. Uh, uh, Doctor Fernando Braga had a remember had a, and he shown he always show the case we are using. This approach, when they put in lateral position, I think the row went up, see, and mm. close the contralateral vein. It had a severe edema in the in the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe went out. It had a severe infarct of the uh, venous uh, infarct because of the edema. Mm. And the other situation that uh, sometimes uh, it, it shows some complications that. Uh, in the vein, the, the occipital internal vein that was damaged during the resection was large tumor, or very large tumor, meningiomas, focotentorial meningiomas, and large tumors coming from this side. It was complicated, it's not uncommon mm -hmm. to have visual field, see? In the literature, not saying about your technique, you are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but the literature is the most common complication of this approach is the visual field, the literature. But what's the trick that you use to avoid this complication? Well, related first of all, the position it's good. related yeah. to, to the vein. Yeah, uh, it was good that I had to look at you so that you could show me what you was going on because I couldn't see. <laughs> the thing is that whenever you place in this position, the the arm mm -hmm. has to be hanging outside of the table. Yeah. Secondly, yeah. remember you should not flex the head too much. Can you can you see me here? Yeah, what yeah. I'm doing? Yeah, you cannot flex the head too much. And also, the, the neck has to be tilted towards the shoulder on the other side. So you do like this. Look at me, Boba, like this. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking. Then look, so th then you wouldn't have a uh, venous compression. Venous compression is, very, is, a, is a big problem. So you have to make the neck as, as uh, free as possible. And besides, look, you should not do this. You, you're looking at me, can you see? Yes, yes, I can see. Yeah, look at this. So you cannot do like this with your head. If you, if you place the patient like this, you have a, the neck too flexed, and then when you tilt, you have a compression here. 
So you're not operating supracerebellar, you're operating interhemispheric. So it's here, not here. So to operate here, you need to flex. To operate here, you have to extend and then tilt. When you do this, the neck is free on both sides. You won't have problems with the, the venous drainage. And besides, the neck would be, the head would be a little bit uh, on, a, uh, on a superior plane than the chest. You see? So you turn like this and go like that. And then you flip. Never, never tuck the head like this. So this is yeah. the problem with the venous no, no. infarction. The second but, problem with uh, operating on, uh, on uh, tumors that have uh, the, the venous complex on top, like the ones on pineal region, you have the, ven uh, the vein of Galen, you have uh, the basal vein of Rosenthal and the internal occipital veins. So the tumor has uh, a close, most of them have a close relationship either with the veins or with the choroid plexus on top, okay? Uh, yeah. Many of them receive uh, uh, their supply through the medial posterior choroidal arteries that go to the choroid plexus and then send branches to the tumor. What you don't have to do is to pull. You should never pull the tumor. That's a, the, the maneuver you have to avoid. So the tumor is, is cut from below and on the sides, and then you work from the sides towards the midline. Never go up straight and use the uh, vein of Galen as a landmark. Most people go, look at the vein of Galen and start to find a plane between the vein of Galen and the tumor. This is wrong. You should go to the side and then deflect the tumor after debulking, never pull. And many times, depending on the tumor, you have to leave remnants. You should not go to try to, to remove everything. Sometimes you, for the removal of everything, you end up damaging the veins. Never pull. Let me show you something here about the position. It's the position that I used to do acoustic, okay? It's not for pineal. Okay. But uh, so you can, to explain better to the people, uh, let me show you here. The arm will be like this. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, uh -huh. totally free. And okay. the head, in the head, is not going straight like, like I used a little bit down for acoustic. You put the head up, up and turns. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Up, um, up and turn down. Turn. The patient is almost looking oh. to the floor, but oh. the head is tilted towards the shoulder. You know, the head go in this direction. Yeah, up and like this up face and tilt this direction. Yeah, and face down, looking down. Let's see if I can. Yeah, you see that. That's on the head yeah. up, face down. Yeah, yes. exactly. And tilt yeah. in the, the arm. The ear, the, the ear should be tilted towards the upper shoulder. Perfect. I use this position for acoustic and posterior fossa, I mean, uh, in Petroso approach also, to I liberate the, the, the jugular and the sigmoid contralateral. See? It's very yeah. important, is it? In it the stays completely problem, free this way, yeah. In the problem that he had, he, he explained that this sh shoulder went up and closed the vein here. In the field. Yeah. This is... The main trick is the surgical position. Great, great, great. I saw here Dr. Jose Nalino from Argentina. He has a lot of experience also in, in brain tumor. I don't know if you have more questions about. Uh, thank you, wonderful. What are your most important criteria? or argument in decision make the choice, supracerebellar or interhemispheric approach? When you decide to come by supracerebellar, when to decide to come, when to decide to come infra or supratentorial? Okay, <laughs> it's either. When the tumor is totally in the midline, you, you come, Listen, the problem or, is or, not or tumor is more lateral. No, that is one thing that people keep saying is that the tumor is in the midline, so it's best to go through the midline. It's not true. You know, you have a good control of midline tumors through the uh, ITT, the interhemispheric transtentorial. So it's not the problem of the midline. I would say that um, maybe, and that's a maybe, uh, when you have a tumor that even in this case, maybe not, because if the tumor is too big, uh, it will already make its own way. So you can just follow the tumor, everything is gonna be open. 
maybe in very small tumors that are not protruding towards the quadrigeminal system, that are tucked inside uh, the posterior portion of the third ventricle, if you are used to, uh, maybe a, a super cerebellar uh, would be better. Uh, also, when you look at the angle, the tentorial angle, if the tentorial angle is not very oblique, is a straight, then you don't have a, a lot of advantage of opening the, the tent. So maybe in this case also, you could operate a super cerebellar, you know? But uh, um, I think no. the, the angle would be the most, uh, the thing that would call my attention, the angle of the tentorium. I remember now when the people, the people was giving a lecture about transcentoral approach, Dr. Oliveira was the first one to uh, raise their hand and said, you, you need to come from the midline, you can see everything in the both sides. Remember Musi? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't know if Elder agrees, but one thing that I think is very important that I show this, when the tumor is above vein of Galen, and pushes the veins, the venous structures downward. I think in that case, yes. you should prefer to go uh, superior, occipital transtentorial. Th that case, I, I think really the occipital transtentorial is much better. Uh, uh, for the other cases, uh, sometimes it's the decision whether you're more comfortable with one or the other. But in but, that case, above the venous structures, I think you should go occipital transcentory. You should but check. But Mosi, tell me, uh, how, how can you reach the, the, the tumors is uh, on top of the veins from below? No, that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling. You should no, always choose the not a That is not a matter of deciding, it just can't go. If you go from below, you cannot reach. But yeah, top yeah, venue, yeah. you'll have different kinds of tumors. That, that, that's a very important thing to, to pay attention to. Hmm? Oh, go ahead, go it's ahead. very important to pay attention to, to the relationship of the, of the veins with the tumor, because oh, you yes. cannot go from below. Yeah, yeah think, perf perfect. Yeah, I agree. Perfect. You cannot go you look, from below. If you look at the back, the background of uh, Musi, okay? His picture <laughs> there, see <laughs> the back. The tumor that's coming over the vein, or a GBM <laughs> invading the, 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 the corpus callosum or a ten, falco tentorium meningioma. In this situation, yeah. you have to come up. Yeah, up, no, no up. question. Yeah. Yeah. In GBM of, of corpus callosum, you don't need surgery. <laughs> <laughs> you need a priest. Yeah, there is one question here to maybe hey, Javier and Musi can answer this. Congrats for the wonderful discussion to the professor. If you have any experience with Dundee vein injury in occipital transtentorial approach, could we sacrifice this vein? Could you produce post-operative cerebellar infarct? I think that you're a little bit confused about the vein. Is the dandy vein is more lateral, but maybe Musi can tell us about what is the dandy vein. The dandy vein I have a lot of resident on mine here. Go ahead, Elder. <laughs> dandy vein is the superior petrosal vein, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 This I, I ask you to, to explain what is the dandy vein for the resident, because the question is a little bit confused. I think so. Yeah, it's the superior uh, petrosal vein. It's the vein uh, just on the anterior side of the junction of the tentorium with the temporal bone. So in that, uh, near the tra trigeminal nerve, in that point you have the superior petrosal vein. But it's more laterally located. You are not going to expose the dandy vein in yeah. uh, pineal surgery. It's not related to this era. Next week, yeah. next month, I think you have petroclival. You can talk about this day. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you have more questions here. If somebody wanna make some comment, the boss is here. Now he has to pay the dinner. <laughs> Go ahead, Professor Suganov. You can, you can close the session. Yes. 
Okay, thank you very much for everybody. It's a really, really beautiful, amazing session. <clears throat> really a lot of, lot of knowledge, especially for young, not, and, uh, <clears throat> not only for young neurosurgeons. Uh, I want to say uh, many thanks to all participants, for all lecturers, and I hope for the future we continue. And thanks again for Professor Borba, uh, uh, Javier, uh, Musi, and Elder for share us uh, uh, knowledge. Thank you very much. We, and that- Thank you. Just, just uh, I want to, to share with you our course from the Education in Training Committee. It will be here in July from seven to nine. It's summer, no? Yeah, summer, July, summer. summer. July. It's a beautiful place in Timmy. It will be very nice. It will be two degrees. Yeah. Two degrees. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It will be not negative, really. 25, 26 in the federal center. Uh, the, the course by Education Training Committee of the World Federation that <coughs> Professor Sufanov, one of the members, and I have the pleasure together with Dr. Kuroda to coordinate. Okay. Thank you all. See you next month. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Ciao. 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 Ciao.